your Bibles, I'd encourage you this morning to turn to the book of Acts. Acts in the 21st passage, uh, 21st chapter of Acts. Thank you for joining us here this morning. If you don't have a Bible this morning, you'll find a Bible in the pew in front of you. Please feel free to take that Bible and use that during the service. If you don't own one, take that Bible home with you as our gift to you. In the Bible in the pew, you'll find our passage of Scripture on page 1,318 and 19. So 1,318 and 19, if you use that Bible in the pew. But Jesus Christ is alive as we sing about all morning long, and it does not change the fact but encourages our heart to understand and realize that Christ is alive. Not lost on me this morning, just the events that surround our nation. I will just mention it briefly and then move right on. Uh, Yesterday we had an event that is tragic in this nation, and there are many pastors and many pulpits this morning who will preach a whole message on the event yesterday. This is not one of those churches. We're going to look at the Bible this morning, just so you know. If you came for a political rally or a political thought, then you're going to have to go somewhere else after church and stay here at the church, because we're looking at the Bible and Jesus Christ this morning. Not only is he risen, we try to lift him up here at First Baptist Church and look at his word this morning. So put that aside for a moment. There is something, though, that kind of catches my attention, which will lead us into our text this morning. And that is the fact that there are two things, two attitudes, two exits, if I can, that will hinder us even stop us from following God. One exit on the highway of God's will is an exit marked F-E-A-R, fear. Fear is an exit that when you take the exit of fear, you cease from following God. If following God is north on 75, then the exit to fear takes you, in a one, uh, takes you in a 180 and puts you on the wrong path, the wrong direction. Following fear, living by fear, will never, will never lead you toward God. It'll always lead you away from God. Yet fear is a juncture at, at many points in our life, or many junctures in our life. Fear causes us to worry. How many times have you worried about something? Could we even number that? All right, but the better question is how many times today did you worry about something? Now, men, if I can talk to you for a moment, we like to get after our wives for their worry. Because women worry and men, we don't worry. Until you're driving down the road, you hear that ticking sound. Well, what is that? And your wife, in perfect faith, says nothing, dear. <laughs> Honey, that's something. I tell you, that's something, right? And then we were, we think about that, and the rest of the day, what what was that sound in the car I heard? All of us have occasion to fear. All of us, men, women, old, young. And just when you think you've conquered fear, guess what happens? God allows another set of circumstances or situations in your life that can cause you, if you're not careful, having faith to fear. Fear causes us to worry. Fear causes us to freeze. The old deer in the headlight look. Now, we laugh at the deer, and we excuse our own frozenness. We stand there in life in indecision. What should I do? I know the path that God has, yet I see all of the problems that could arise, the unknown, and I fear, and I'm caught in indecision. Fear causes us to freeze, but fear also will cause us to fail. When we operate in fear, we will fail. Can I remind you of a little-known Bible character? His first name is um, Simon. Simon Peter. He had a little chance to fear standing by the fire the night that Jesus Christ was taken captive and put on trial. And a little girl, maybe 12 years old, maybe at the most 15, asked Peter a simple question. Now Peter, looking at his character, looking at his uh, persona in the Bible, larger than life and a fisherman and and pretty strong fisherman, he dragged a lot of fish in there. He was was strong and he was robust, it seems like, and, and a spokesperson, an extrovert. I doubt that Peter many times in his life was failing because of a teenage or younger girl. In fact, if you had gone to Peter and said, Peter, you're going to have the greatest failing in your life because of a young girl, I think Peter would have laughed at you. I'm sure he would have. In fact, because when Jesus said you're going to fail, he said no way. Not even knowing that it would be a young girl. That would kind of be the, the catalyst for this failure. 
But Peter denied Jesus Christ three times. Three times. Fear causes us to fail. But there's another exit. Not only is there fear, and we'll see that in this passage, there's another exit off the highway of God's will, God's direction, God's path. And this is the exit that's marked L-O-G-I-C. Did you get that, Gail? You're thinking about that. She's like, man, L-O. Go back. Just about one more time, Pastor. Logic. 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 How many times it's not fear that causes us to, to fumble, but logic. Well, this, this exit makes a lot of sense, Pastor. You see, it just makes sense. And God gave me a brain to use it. He gave you a brain to use it to know him. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. We are not here to exercise our senses. We are here to exercise our faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And this morning, fear and logic stand in the way. There are many Christians who love God sincerely, who worship God authentically, yet they have fear in their life or they live by logic. And because of those two exits, they're not completely following God. So let's look at occasion in Scripture in Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse number 8. We're going to find a, a time when Paul, the Apostle Paul, we face with these two particular exits. And let's see what God brings to our attention. Beginning in verse number 8, where the Bible says this, And the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. The same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. Now, I included these two verses in the text, just uh, they're, they're not really part of the sermon, but as I was reading the text and, and where they're going from here to the next point and what God does, it intrigued me because Philip was one of the seven, one of the seven deacons that we find earlier, earlier in the book of Acts. All right? One of the deacons that was full of, of faith and the Holy Spirit that, that, that the people of, uh, of Jerusalem and the different Christians knew that Philip was a godly man, knew that Philip uh, was a worshiping man. He had a good testimony. God had used Philip the evangelist, one who shared the gospel extensively. But what caught my attention as I was getting ready for the sermon that was not part of the sermon was the fact that Philip was not only a good Christian out in public, Philip was a good Christian at home. Because he had four daughters, which also did prophesy. That means that somehow along the way, Philip not only lived it in the church house, he lived it in his house. That those young girls, those daughters, they saw their dad. They saw him at church and worship. They also saw him at home. And he must have been authentic because they also realized, this is the God that I want to serve. And if Philip had been, had been a fake in public, then those girls would not have been the testimony that they would have had. I tell you right now, you can make a difference. Live the same here and here. And Philip was one such man who lived in front of everyone the same way in front of his daughters. And not one, not two, but four of his daughters, those four daughters, were prophesying for Jesus Christ. But that's not the sermon today, so let's continue on the passage, please. Verse number 10. And as we tarried there many days, there came down from Judea a certain prophet named Agabus. And when he was come unto us, he took Paul's girdle and bound his own hands and feet. He took Paul's coat and he wrapped it, Agabus wrapped it around his hands and his feet. And he said this, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Let's pause there real quick in verse 11. Let me ask you an easy question. All right, you're going to get 100, 100 on this pop quiz. Is what Agabus prophesied, is it good news or bad news? Bad news. Bad news. No one in here would love God to tell you, listen, when you go home, you're getting handcuffs. And you're going to be li delivered into pe people's hands who want to kill you, who are against you. No one would say, wow, that sounds wonderful. Boy, I better hurry home. That would not be a natural reaction, would it not? 
well, would it be a natural reaction would be to like, oh no, this isn't good. Could you not see how there could be an occasion for fear right here? Anybody see that? Raise your hand if you see the occasion for fear. Paul, you're going to go get captured. I want you to notice what happens, and we'll pray and begin this, this sermon message this morning. Verse number 12. And when we heard these things, both we, now that is the writer of the book of Acts, whom we know to be Luke, the physician. Luke, the author of the gospel. Luke, who accompanied Paul on multiple missionary journeys. Luke, who was a faithful servant of God. Luke, who was not weak in the faith, but strong in the faith, and other companions. But we, both we, and they of that place, all right, A in that place, they said this, besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, persuaded, has to do with logic, doesn't it? When he would not listen to reason, like when he would not understand what we're trying to say to him, when he would not get the point of what we're trying to do here. Paul, like, like get with it, Paul. We're, we're trying to persuade you. When he would not do that, we ceased, saying this powerful statement, the will of the Lord be done. My friends, that should be our heart's cry, the will of the Lord be done be done. Whether in life or in death, the will of the Lord be done. Whether I'm rich or whether I'm poor, the will of the Lord be done. Whether I'm full emotionally or whether I'm spent emotionally, whether I have all the relationships that I desire or whether I have no one that is with me or stands with me, the will of the Lord be done. Whether I've had my expectations met or whether every expectation I've had seems like a complete failure, the will of the Lord be done. So that there are no exits on this path of God's will. I'd like to point out three truths from this state, from this passage. That's Lord's help. Lord, help us this morning as we look at this portion of Scripture. Lord, I pray for your strength, for your help, that as I speak, these things would honor and please you, that your truth would be powerfully effective in this room this morning, that our hearts would be open, Lord, that our minds would be touched. And I pray that if there are those who are waffling, on the highway of your will, seeing these exits of fear or logic, that this morning they would, with these disciples and with Paul, declare that the will of the Lord would be done in their life. Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you as Savior, I pray that today they would understand the gospel and what you've done for them. That today they'd be saved by trusting in you. Lord, we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name, I ask. Amen. I want you to look this morning at just a few points in this portion of Scripture. I want you to notice, first of all, God's path. God's path. Uh, we find that in verses uh, 10, uh, 10 and 11, where Agabus comes down, the prophet, binds the girdle, Paul's girdle, his own hands, his own feet, we read it, and then makes this declaration, this prophecy, from the Holy Ghost. The Scripture tells us, because Scripture is given to us from God, uh, Scripture tells us that this was not a false prophecy, but this was truth. And that Agabus was speaking as a mouthpiece of, a mouth, a mouthpiece of God that when Paul went to Jerusalem, he was going to be captured. He was going to be bound up. There was no, no, no case of mistaken identity, and there was no room for interpretation. This was not something that Paul could say, well, I, I feel what this means to me. No, this was clear revelation from God. Paul, when you go to Jerusalem, you are going to be caught. You're going to be bound up, and you will be delivered to the Gentiles. We also understand from that what's implied is that, Paul, you will never escape this imprisonment. This is it for you. Like, like th this is the final journey, Paul, in your, in your path for God. Th that is why those disciples, those near to him, reacted so strongly. 
And this was not like other times when, when Paul's with Silas and, and they're in the jail and they begin to sing and God opens up the jail. No, Paul, this is it. God's path was made very clear to Paul. You're not going to make it. You are going to suffer and you're in for a world of hurt. Boy, that's not very good news, is it now? Like, Pastor, that's kind of depressing. You could say, well, Pastor, I can turn on my TV. I can go on YouTube, and I can find a lot of, quote, preachers who will preach a different gospel, that Jesus just wants me to be happy, and nothing bad will ever happen. And they are lying to you. They are lying to you. Jesus wants you to be full of joy as you abide in him. But my friends, they can't promise you a day of peace more than they can promise you the moon. They are lying to you. You can send them 100 bucks, you will not get a blessing, but they'll get a blessing of 100 bucks from you. That's a blessing that, that will be received that you give. There are false teachers, there are false prophets, there are false preachers and false pastors who, who will say this, you follow God and he will cushion your path. No, my Bible says you follow God, he will direct your path. He will direct it. He will make it to be plain. He'll make it to be straight. But there are some times when God's news isn't good news. Now, that's not always the case, but there are those times, and right here, God's news wasn't good news. God's path isn't always the easiest path. God's path is not always the easiest path. God's path is not always the most comfortable path. But God's path is always the best path. I don't know what God has on your path. I don't know what is down the road, what, on your highway of your life, what God has for you. For some of you, it could be a sickness. And as you come into the sickness, you think, this is not good news. This is not comfortable, but it will be God's path. And God's path, though it may not be the easiest path, though it may not be the most comfortable path, God's path is always the best path. Mark it down. There is no safer place to be than in the middle of God's will. Write it down. There is no better place to be than right where God wants you to be. And you may be bound up physically, literally, or emotionally and health-wise, but God's path is always the best path. We could take time this morning, or if we had time, we could take a moment, and we could take the microphone around this room. We'd hear a few things. First of all, if I asked for hard times, we could fill the time with trouble. In this room, we could fill it with trouble. You, you, could, you could tell me stories that would make people weep in this room. Things you went through as a child, or perhaps last week in health and in family. Terrible things. But then you'd hear this. You'd hear some who would relate these things and, and end it like this. But God is so good. But through it all, God was with me, and God carried me through, and God is so gracious, and I don't deserve anything else, and, and, I, and I, I wouldn't want to go through it, but I wouldn't trade it. And there would be others who would sound like Jacob in the Old Testament. Few and evil have been my days. And they'd finish out their little example of trouble with, I hate my life. My friends choose to be in God's path because God's path is the best path. But notice also what happens here. Verse number 12. We see some good friends. Now, these are godly friends, but they steer off a little bit in the wrong direction. Verse number 12, when we heard these things, both we and they of that place besought him pled with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, as we kind of start and keep your finger there in Acts chapter 21. We're going to go to two other passages that are close by. Some will submit that Paul was not supposed to go to Jerusalem. In fact, earlier in Acts, we did not read this, this portion, but look in verse number 4 of Acts chapter 21. In finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. 
There's some that would say, you know, Paul was not supposed to go to Jerusalem, that that was his own fault and, and his own error. I'd like you to turn back to Acts chapter 19. Hold your finger 21, because we'll come back to 21. In Acts chapter 19, Paul is on a missionary journey. In verse number 21 of Acts 19, the Bible says this, And after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and the Cai, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. Now, when we understand this passage, it says he purposed in the Spirit. We understand that to, to, to mean that Paul, through the leading of the Spirit, it was not just Paul's own spirit and own desire, though it was a desire, that the Holy Spirit was leading him to Jerusalem. Slide with me to another passage in chapter number 20. Chapter 20, beginning verse 21. Testifying, this is Paul speaking, both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the what? What does the Bible say? In the Spirit. Again, reverencing not just his Spirit, but the Holy Spirit. I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. What we can kind of gather from this is not that Paul shouldn't have gone, but that God had warned Paul what was going to happen to Jerusalem. It was not going to be all pleasant. Paul was warned by the spirit of impending danger, but still he follows God. I see, I see here in verse number 12, though, two things happen. One, I see pleading from his friends. Luke and other companions, other people who love God, we besought him not to go up to Jerusalem. You see, good intentions are not always God's intentions. I don't think these men were trying to dissuade Paul from following God. I think they're honestly concerned for him. And, and maybe they said something like this. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us what, what they used to try to persuade him. But maybe they said something like, Paul, listen, you have many years of ministry left. Don't waste it in Jerusalem. Paul, you've seen a great harvest for God. Look at Ephesus. Look at Corinth. Look at all these places, Colossae and Thessalonica. Paul, God has used you. So don't go to Jerusalem. God doesn't want you to go there. Except Paul knew that was his path. There was a pleading with him. No doubt they tried to persuade him with logic. Paul was a very intelligent man. I'm sure they use logic. Paul, look at this. This doesn't make any sense. Paul, this is not God's will for your life. There's not only a pleading, there was a pull from his friends. A pull from his friends. In fact, Paul says this in verse number 13. What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? Now, now understand something here that, that I think is fascinating. Paul was not sad when Agabus the prophet declared him to be bound up. Paul's heart was not discouraged or disheartened when the prophecy of God's path came. Paul was not weeping, his heart breaking, oh no, I'm going to die in Jerusalem, or I'm going to die after that point. But Paul says, this is what really got to me. When my good friends, when those whom I love and, and my companions, like when you're working on me, that's breaking my heart. Good intentions aren't always God's intentions. Remember this, just because it makes sense doesn't mean it's God's will. I read something this, this morning, and I don't, I don't jump on social media all the time, but I read this thing that, that my, my pastor's friends, I was caught up in, in two different threads. Um, now, I don't comment on social media, but, but one thread after the events from yesterday was a pastor saying, men, make sure we preach Jesus Christ in the pulpit tomorrow. All right, and the comments for that, many good pastors are like, no, it's time to pr preach the events and tell what's happening. And I'm like, we can't preach events, we've got to preach the Bible. All right, so I was already a little bit in my spirit like, come on now, what are we doing? If pastors can't preach the Bible, who's going to preach the Bible? But then there was a statement that was made that sounds good, but is deviously deceptive and is the hand of Satan. 
is made from a man who's not a Baptist, but many Baptist pastors will follow and many Christian people will follow. And he makes this statement. And I'm going to lead it with this. Just because it makes sense does not mean it's God's will. Here's a statement. Churches with minimal programming help their people live among the world as missionaries by not asking them to live at the church, but to live as the church. Hashtag simple church. Now, at first glance, you hear these say, you know what? That's right. We're missionaries in this pagan world. And church is too busy. And the less I'm at church, the more I have time to minister to other people. The only problem is that Jesus is on the other side of this equation. And Jesus says that the closer you come to the coming of Christ, you should assemble as a church more and more. Don't you hate when the theology of the Bible contradicts a social media post? Don't you hate that? Don't you hate it? I did not comment. I, I cannot comment on those things. But I was, I was moved in my spirit because I already worked on this sermon. I thought, just because it makes sense doesn't mean it's God's will. All right? And furthermore, this is what they're saying. The less time you spend in church, the more you'll honor Jesus Christ. Remember, churches with minimal programming, with, with less time in church, help their people live as missionaries better. So the less time we spend together means the more you can live for Jesus Christ. Except in the early church in Jerusalem, they met every day from house to house. They spent a whole lot of time together to live for Jesus Christ. But what I'm saying is, listen, there are times that there are people who sound good and who have good intentions. Right? They're not trying to deceive and, and disrupt. But just because it makes sense, just because the intentions are good, that doesn't mean it's God's path. There's that exit march logic that you got to be careful not to take. We walk by faith, not by sight. And we see last of all this morning the great calling. The great calling. Verse number 13 and 14. Then Paul answered, what mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready. Are you ready this morning? Are you ready? Paul says, I'm ready. Are you ready? Sometimes we're not ready for God to come back. We're not ready to serve God. We're not ready. Paul says, I'm ready. Like I'm eager. I'm anxious. I'm ready today. I'm not sitting idly back aside. I'm not wasting my time. I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Paul says, I'm not going there to die for myself. I don't want a statue. I don't want accolades. I'm going there, and if I die, I'm dying for Jesus Christ. And he says in another place, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul says, I am ready for the great calling, for the greatest calling. You see, following God is the highest calling. Following God is the greatest calling. Obeying Jesus Christ is the best thing we can do. Three things happened First of all, Paul acknowledged what was going on. What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? He accepted what God has for him. See, sometimes the Lord calms the storm. And sometimes God calms his child in the storm. And Paul said, this storm will not be calmed, but I am calm because I have Jesus Christ. It's high time that we quit praying for the calming of the storm and seek the calming of the Savior. Life may be disrupted, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And on that path, his path, God's path, is the greatest place we can be. Then they acquiesced. The Bible says these men... These women, they ceased. We see saying the will of the Lord be done. Someone said this, that we are made and we are inwardly fashioned for faith. We're not fashioned for fear. That's why when someone worries, when someone has anxiety, that their body literally breaks apart. When you carry that stress, your internal organs cannot 
withstand the stress from your mind and the fear and anxiety and worry and panic. We are not fashioned for fear. We are fashioned for faith. When we follow our logic, we literally make a failure of life because we're not fashioned for logic. We're fashioned for faith. And Paul says, I am ready to be bound. I am ready to give my life for Jesus Christ. We find out in 2 Timothy. We find that Paul did go to Jerusalem, that Paul was bound there. He stood before different men, different trials. We'll discover that in the next few weeks in Acts. But in 2 Timothy, when Paul's riding to Timothy from his house arrest, Paul says this, At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. And my friends, if we go through trials and tests, I hope that we can stand together as Christians. But if someone doesn't stand with you, don't be discouraged. God will stand with you. And if all men forsake you, Paul says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. And I'd be thankful for your help. I'd be thankful for your support. But my friends, I need God to stand with me. You ought to be thankful for those around you who are Christians who will pray and support you. But you need, you must have God stand with you. And when you stand in his will and follow his path, then no matter what happens, God will be with you. But quite simply, Paul says, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Quite plainly, Paul says, though no one join me, still I must follow. Paul says, the world behind me, the cross before me. I have decided to follow Jesus. It's 150 years ago or so when that song was, was penned. As the story goes, there's a group of missionaries who came to an aggressive area, northern India, tribal region. Primitive and aggressive headhunters. And one missionary, after sharing the gospel, saw a man, wife, and his children trust Jesus Christ. The leader of that tribe, the village chief, called the family and summoned all the villagers. He called the family who had first converted to renounce their faith in public or face execution. God's path is not always the easiest path. God's path is not always the most comfortable path, but God's path is always the best path. He asked that man, will you renounce your faith? And moved by the Holy Spirit, the man uttered these words, I have decided to follow Jesus. Enraged, the village chief ordered the archers to shoot the man's two boys. And they did. As the boys were lying on the ground, the chief asked the man again, now your sons are dead. Will you denounce your Jesus? The man replied this, though no one join me, still I will follow. There's exits fear, exits of logic. But my friends, those exits take you on a 180 path and keep you from following God's will. Chief was even angrier. Ordered the archers to shoot the man's wife, which they did. The 
In a moment, she joined her children in death. The chief asked this man one more time, will you renounce your faith? Deny your faith and live. The man had one last statement. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. See, my friends, we're in a great calling, the highest calling there is, the calling of Jesus Christ. No matter where that leads us, no matter what end that takes us to, may we echo the words of Paul, the disciples that day, and this man, the will of the Lord be done. This morning, have you decreed, I have decided to follow Jesus? Have you made that commitment, first of all, in salvation, asking him for forgiveness of sins, but then to live by faith? In the face of fear, by the exit of logic as it flashes by, I have decided to follow Jesus. Following Jesus is the greatest calling of a Christian. And yet our churches are full, sometimes the pews are full of people who live by fear, by logic. They say, of course, Pastor, I'm following Jesus. I'm here Sunday morning. My friends, it's only one step in the path of following Jesus Christ. It's every day, setting aside my worry and my fear. It's clearly setting aside what I may see and saying, you and only you, Lord. Your path doesn't appear to be easy, but I accept it. Your path is dark and gloomy at the end, it appears, but that's what I want. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. Music